Ganbare Goemon is a long-running series of games from Konami that has appeared on many different systems starting from the NES era. Most of the entries in the series appeared on Nintendo consoles, including the only ones to be localized for audiences outside of Japan, so naturally people associate Goemon and friends with the big N. However, in the mid to late 90s, arguably at the height of the series' popularity, the mystical ninja would embark on several adventures on Sony's new and noteworthy system, the original PlayStation. The first of these was the 1996 release Uchu Kaizoku Gaku Gingu, which was in many ways similar to Ganbari Goemon 3 on the Super Famicom, and in a bold move replaced series favorite Sasuke and Yae with two new playable characters. It's a solid game that took advantage of the new hardware in some really fun ways, sporting a unique and funky art style that I'm a big fan of. The second Goemon game developed for the PS1 should be familiar to regular viewers of import gaming for the win, as I covered it way back in episode 17. Kurunara Koi Aishigekka no Kuroi Kage released in late 1998. While its high-risk polygonal graphics were quite impressive and its story and cast of heroes and villains were a lot of fun, you couldn't really say the same about its game design, especially when comparing it to its fantastic 3D cousins on the N64. But with that being said, I still... Ah, oh, come on! What's with the noise? Is it recycling day already? Jesus. <sighs> Better finish up this beer and put these cans and bottles out for collection ASAP. <sighs> right in the middle of a video. This really chaps my head. Whoa, what's this? Why, it's the third PlayStation Goemon title, just laying here in a recycling bin. Well, isn't that just the strangest, totally unplanned coincidence? Released relatively late in the PlayStation's life cycle, Ganbare Goemon Oero Dai Kaiten was published on March 31, 2001 by Konami of course, with development duties delegated to its Kobe studio. Oero Dai Kaiten can be translated to something like Oero's Great Revolution, with the revolution part continuing the series' long tradition of including puns in their names. You'll get it a little bit later on. This game is notable not only for being one of the very last Goemon titles, <clears throat> as of the year 2020, fingers crossed. But if you don't count the futuristic reboot spin-offs, it's the final entry in the series to be presented in the classic side-scrolling style Goemon fans have come to know and love. Oero Dai Kaiten starts off with the iconic duo of the heroic Goemon and his pudgy partner Ibisumaru on the road. They aren't on their way to rob from the rich and give to the poor, nor are they on a mission to save a damsel in distress from a flamboyant goofball bad guy. No, this time they've decided to tackle the very important task of… tossing out their garbage. Oero has been hit by a recycling boom, and the two are doing their part by taking part in it. After the deed is done, they run into Omitsu, who's brought some delicious food for them. Their picturesque picnic is abruptly interrupted, however, when they notice a good friend making a mad dash nearby, the noble Kunoichi Yae. But before they can even assess the situation, a giant soft drink can suddenly smashes into Bisumaru's thick head, leaving quite the literal impact. The two of them discover that this can is more than just another man's trash, and sensing their friend Yae is in danger, they spring into action to save her. It turns out that this can is some kind of strange robot of unknown origin, and just as quickly as he's found out, he retreats toward Oedo Castle. Thankfully, Yae is safe, but all is not well in the land of Oedo, as the mechanical ninja Sasuke appears to inform the trio that the Lord of Oedo and his daughter, Princess Yuki, have vanished from the castle. The four heroes resolve to confront the mysterious robotic can at the castle and discover the whereabouts of the royal family, 
as well as the meaning behind the appearance of the odd, can-shaped menace they just encountered. As you can see, the game's main theme is recycling, but it's not just a plot device that drives the story forward. The entire game seems to have been designed with that theme in mind, since Oedo Daikaiten literally recycles many elements from past titles in the series in order to create a new but familiar adventure for Goemon and Pals, which we'll go over in detail over the course of this video. After the opening cutscene, the game starts off on Hagure Hill, the first of many action stages connected via a world map that looks and functions the same as it did in Ganbare Goemon 2, Kiteretsu Shogun McGinnis for the Super Famicom. This map is split into a total of 6 areas, each representing a different region of Japan, with a new area introduced when a new chapter in the game begins. You've surely noticed from earlier gameplay footage that while Oedo Dai Kaiten is primarily a 2D action side-scroller like many of its predecessors, one of the more unique aspects of the game is its graphical style. Environments make use of the power of the PlayStation and are mostly comprised of 3D polygons. However, characters and enemies consist mainly of two-dimensional pre-rendered sprites. While I'm sure to most the game's visuals aren't quite as charming and attractive as the previous generation of Goemon games were, its presentation and art direction are still pretty good overall. As far as the character designs go, Ibisumaru and Sasuke pretty much look like they always have, but Yae has gotten a bit of a makeover, since she wears the outfit that was introduced in Mononoke Sugoroku and Dochu, which seems to have been influenced by her appearance in some of the Goemon manga. Oddly, even though he's the titular star of the game, Goemon is the only one who looks off in Oedo Dai Kaite, mainly because his mouth is formed by a really thick black line that makes him stand out more than everybody else in cutscenes and promotional art, and not in a good way. Oedo Dai Kaiten plays very much like the previously referenced Ganbare Goemon 2 for the Super Famicom, which I talked about at length on episode 12 of Import Gaming for the Win. Actually, the gameplay in both are so similar that I can pretty much copy whole sections from that video script and paste it here and everything would pretty much apply just the same. Each character has different playstyles that set them apart from one another, but there are a few universal things that they all have in common. There are the basic things like jumping, ducking down, and moving while ducking down, and the standard attack, which can be leveled up twice by finding a lucky cat item drop by fallen enemies. You can also switch to a projectile attack, but unfortunately, using it has two major downsides. One is that the player's pool of money decreases each time a projectile is thrown, so you can go broke pretty quickly by using this attack too often. And the other is that enemies defeated by projectile drop no money or items, and trust me, you're gonna want as much money and lucky cats as you can find. <clears throat> The four playable characters are of course made up of the classic Goemon crew seen in the opening cutscene, all of whom can be selected right from the very start of the game, and each with his or own unique abilities and attributes. As always, Goemon's main weapon is his trusty Kiseru, and he throws a single Koban coin for his projectile attack. Pressing Triangle executes his special move where he attacks using his chain pipe, which has longer range than his standard pipe attack, but more importantly allows him to latch onto special blocks to swing to otherwise inaccessible locations. Ibisumaru uses a Harisen, a large paper slapping fan, to whack enemies off into the distance and is armed with Shuriken for his sub-weapons. His special move allows him to jump and use a couple of fans to glide over long distances and ascend wherever a gust of wind blows upward. Yae runs faster than Goemon and Ibisumaru, slicing and dicing with her deadly katana and blowing foes away with her even deadlier bazooka. Her special ability is transforming into a mermaid, which lets her swim and attack underwater. And then there's Sasuke with his pair of kunai and bomb projectile attacks, which are quite different from his fellow heroes. Bombs are usually tossed in an arc, exploding after a brief period of time or on impact with an enemy, and leveling up his standard kunai adds projectiles to the attack, preventing collection of money and items from downed enemies. Similar to Yae, he too runs faster than Goemon and Ibisumaru, and his special ability grants him the capability to swim. Each character's projectile can be charged and made more effective by holding down the attack button, at extra cost, obviously. Goemon and friends will traverse through a variety of different locales in Oedo Daikaiten stages, from those grounded in reality, lush forests, deep caves, dangerous mountains, to the utterly bizarre and surreal, a giant Japanese sushi conveyor belt, a Japanese restaurant that must cater to giants, and a Japanese traditional toy store that must cater to the children of giants. Aside from the standard platforming, there are several stages with some fun set pieces, such as parasailing over the ocean blue and being chased down the slopes of a snowy mountain by whatever the hell this creepy thing is supposed to be. There are even a few vehicles you can command here, and once again, all of this should look and sound very familiar if you played Goemon 2 on the Super Famicom. Some sections of the game require a certain character's special ability to proceed, so thankfully this can be done on the fly by pressing the select button to switch out characters should the need arise. 
Many Goemon titles are well known for their fantastic co-op gameplay, and thankfully this one also continues the tradition by allowing two buddies to conquer the foes of Oedo Japan together, and it's such a blast! Characters can be swapped at any time, and both players can even play as the same character if desired. Piggybacking off your partner is also a memorable co-op feature in the Goemon series, one that is sadly absent in Oedo Daikaiten. In its place is the ability for one character to transform into a gourd and automatically follow the other by pressing the circle button, which is helpful in certain areas when a player might be lacking in platforming skills, but it's definitely more fun being carried than becoming a revolving inanimate object. Some of the levels in Oedo Daikaiten are a breeze, but most are quite challenging, and several are ones I would consider some of the most difficult stages in the entire series. Hidden in obscure areas are golden lucky cats that increase the life bar by one, and Oiribukuro that adds to the player's stock of lives. But neither of these are really all that useful, since you risk falling to your death to reach most of them. Once again, like Goemon 2 on the Super Famicom, a vast majority of deaths in this game won't come about from a lack of hit points, but rather from that cruel mistress, Gravity. Thankfully, like many of the Goemon games that came before it, checkpoints in the form of elephant markers are placed near the halfway point in many stages, allowing you to continue midway through a level should you fail to make it to the end. If you lose all of your lives, you can continue pretty much immediately, and the checkpoint is saved. The major downside is that you lose half of your money as well as any life or weapon bonuses. Playing in co-op negates a lot of the frustration from death by pitfall, however, because if one player dies while the other is still alive and kicking it, he or she will fly back into the picture and be granted temporary invincibility. You can also save yourself last minute by pressing circle to go full gourd and instantly transport to where your partner is, which is very useful, as long as your partner isn't sucking at the moment like you. Each area on the world map has a town, which functions much like they do in nearly every Goemon game ever made, and the first one you'll visit is a series mainstay, Goemon's hometown of Hakuremachi. This town as well as all the others are populated by many kinds of people, those who are friendly and those who are not so friendly, those you can smack around with impunity, and those who will go medieval Japan on your ass if you mess with the wrong folks. And as usual, there are those elusive ladies strolling about who add to either your hit points or your bank account just by running into them. There's so much to do in any given town, but the most important purpose they serve is offering a place to save the game, which is done at the end. You can keep 3 save logs per memory card and continue from where you left off should you retire to the real world. But unfortunately, any upgrades to the character's weapons and health bars are lost, and lives are reset to the default number of 2. In addition to saving, you can stay the night to rest, the fancier the room meaning the greater the comfort. But inns aren't the only place to restore your health, since there are restaurants that sell a variety of food to fill up your stomach as well as your hearts, and certain towns are home to public bathhouses that make you so fresh and so clean. More so if you actually head into the bath meant for your character's gender. Well, with the exception of Abisumaru, he's a pimp. Well, uh, sometimes anyway. Bathing with full health also has the added bonus of increasing max hit points by one. There's always a general store found in each town which is primarily stocked with the classic inventory Goemon fans should all be familiar with. Rice balls that restore health once all hit points have been depleted, armor that protects from standard damage, and headgear that prevents damage from projectiles. Mini games have been a common part of the town experience from the very first game in the series, so it's no surprise that Oedo Daikaiten lets the player enjoy a few of them. You can hit up the gambling house and hope to win some cash by rolling dice, engage in rock paper scissor battles, and strike your opponent using a toy hammer when you win and defend when you lose, play a simple game of card matching, or have some fun playing whack-a-mole alone or with a friend. Not really the most enjoyable or interesting mix of games in the Goemon series, but it's nice to have some diversion, though with the exception of the dice game, you absolutely have to play and succeed in these games to progress through Oedo Daikaiten. This game brings back the gate pass feature from previous titles, requiring one before the player can leave town and continue on the journey. Winning the aforementioned minigames will reward the player with a whole or partial gate pass, but the method of acquiring passes is different in each town. It could involve completing a standard fetch quest, or it could be as simple as saving up and buying one from a store. The last thing you can do in towns is visit a travel agency, which will allow you to go to any previously visited towns with the click of a button. But the world map doesn't take too long to get around in general, so it's not really that useful. 
what can take a bit of time to travel through our towns themselves, since they tend to be a little too big for practicality's sake. But thankfully you could pause the game and press select to return to the world map. This works for action stages as well, which is really handy for collecting money and power-ups. Clearing all action stages and getting through the town gate all leads to the final part of an area, the boss stage. Naturally, these levels tend to be longer and filled with more hazards than any of the stages that preceded it. The Area 1 boss stage in this game takes place at Oledo Castle, a classic boss stage in the series, and this rendition of the level has the heroes running across rooftops, performing well-timed jumps off of Japanese Suzumi drums, and avoiding spiked floors and ceilings. In the innermost chamber of the castle, Goemon confronts the odd robotic can he met at the onset of the adventure, who complains of the persistence of the heroes. But rather than take them on himself, he has an even more persistent opponent in mind for the fight, someone with a long history of taking L's in the series, Kabuki. Of course there's no way he was going to break his losing streak, unless you're really awful at video games, and this recycled villain is easily disposed of in the proper manner. The dastardly can has one more trick up his aluminum sleeve, however, and plans on crushing the hero with Kabuki's giant mecha, so that only means one thing. Ah yes, what post-16-bit Goemon game would be complete without the iconic, autonomous, yet pilotable giant robot impact? He controls the way he basically always does. Koban coins can be shot out of his nose, he can punch with a fast left jab or slug it out with a slower, more powerful right, he can block using both of his steel arms, grapple onto and reel in his foe with an enormous chain pipe, and perform all sorts of combos that create special attacks, such as shooting super laser beams or pummeling bad guys to dust with a truly overpowered 100 strike punch. Playing in co-op splits attacking duties between friends, with one in charge of the left arm and the other with the right, which involves a lot of communication, miscommunication, and of course, good time. <laughs> After emerging victorious in this battle, Goemon and friends aren't any wiser regarding the background of this new can-shaped nemesis, nor are they any closer to finding the royal family, so they must continue moving throughout Japan to find the answers. Along the journey they'll encounter four more robotic cans, and each time one is confronted, he'll reintroduce the heroes to an unfriendly blast from the past, which includes Spring Breeze dancing for the mystical ninja starring Goemon on the N64, General McGinnis from Goemon 2 on the Super Famicom, and Harakiri Seppukumaru from Goemon 4, also on Nintendo 16-bit hardware. Also among these foes is the enigmatic fortune teller Plasma, which is a bit odd since he's an ally to the good guys in most games, but was a boss character in the Game Boy Mononoke Dolchu RPG. In addition to these standard boss battles, two more former enemies make returns in impact segments. The five robotic cans collectively call themselves the Steel Five, and as you've probably guessed, they aren't the masterminds behind the kidnapping of the royals, but are instead simply henchmen carrying out the plans of a bigger, badder villain. In this case, it's a dandy and narcissistic man known as the Recycling Master, Ekorori-sai. As the game progresses, Princess Yuki's loyal pet, the ninja cat Kurobe, provides intel on Oedo's latest rogue. He has used his genius and skills in the area of recycling to utilize the nation's garbage to create a menacing army, terrible weapons, and a fortress off the eastern coast of Japan. He can even somehow recycle people, changing them to bend to his desires, and plans on doing just that to win the heart of Princess Yuki. Yeah, good luck with that. 
Eventually, you will have a final showdown with the Steel 5 and Ekororisai. And without giving away too many of the details, victory means saving the girl, again. Saving the world, again. And being treated to a weird and not entirely satisfying ending, again. So those are the basics of Oero Daikaiten. In total, I spent about 8 hours in between hitting the start button for the first time and viewing the end credits. But a lot of that playtime came about due to drinking and goofing around in co-op mode with a friend. With all that I've gone over in this video, this must seem like another classic entry in the Goemon series, right? Well, it's not. But it's still pretty good. Using the theme of recycling as a means of implementing tried and true game mechanics and bringing back the beloved foils from previous adventures sounds really clever on paper, one made up of 100% reused materials, and should have made Oedo Daikaiten feel like a love letter to Goemon fans. But it all just feels a bit too cheap and like a budget title to really hit the mark, with the theme of recycling used as a convenient cover for a quick and easy cash-in. While there are no real glaring flaws in Oedo Daikaiten, there are a few that stick out. In general, levels feel a bit too short, and many stages feel uninspired in spite of their interesting premises. There aren't any real extras in the game that extend replay value, though there are two optional stages, one requiring a bit of work to discover, but nothing is really lost in the overall experience if either are skipped. Cutscenes are amusing and voiced really well, but presentation is flat, bland, and ultimately uninteresting, especially compared to its PS1 counterparts. You may have noticed that I haven't even talked about the music, and truth be told, it's one of the best soundtracks in the entire series. Because it's mostly made up of tracks from the N64 games Mystical Ninja Star and Goemon and Goemon's Great Adventure. How's that for recycling? Speaking of music, anytime there's a change of scenery, big or small, the music stops and restarts from the beginning. It may seem like a minor gripe, but it does get annoying in towns when you're constantly moving in and out of houses and other establishments. It's a bit hard to pinpoint exactly why this game isn't the classic it should have been, since it literally has all the components that make up a great Goemon game. I think the best way to put it is that the final product somehow ends up being less than the sum of its parts, lacking some of the heart and soul of what people love about Ganbare Goemon. It seems the development team Casey Ikobe knew how to make a competent platforming game, but just didn't get Ganbare Goemon like Casey Osaka did, who made the popular N64 titles. The Kobe team at least did a far better job here than Konami Computer Entertainment Nagoya did with their less than stellar offerings. On a more positive note, Oedo Daikaiten did sell relatively well, as it saw at least two more print runs, one under the Konami The Best label and another through the PS1 book series, you know, those games with no back artwork. And you know, call me an idiot who doesn't know good games or call me the Goemon Defender. But despite all its shortcomings, I personally love this game. While it's not the most memorable Ganbare Goemon game, and it's not even the best Goemon game on the PlayStation, it still has more than enough charm and bits of nostalgia for fans of the series to put their controllers down and walk away satisfied from the experience. And for PS1, platforming, or import gaming fans, this is a solid title that provides hours of fun, especially in co-op. And perhaps the best part of it all is that it does not require years of budget planning in order to afford it, thankfully. Oero Daikaiten is worthy of being a part of any collection, though it's not quite the great tribute to Ganbare Goemon fans deserved. That would have to wait a few years down the road for the title that really captured the magic of the series and even lets you take it with you wherever you went. But maybe I'll talk about that in a future episode of Import Gaming for the Win. Anyway, this is Jimmy Hoppa. Hope you enjoyed the video and whoever you are, wherever you are, whenever you are, take care.
Hmm, think you can do a Gombari Goemon episode again and not put me in the video, huh? I didn't make my millions localizing games just to be treated like a fan translator on the internet and get tossed aside like human empathy in the age of social media. I'll be back. Next time, Hoppa. Next time! Or just this time, I'm not really sure.